for the Lord does say that you are to watch and pray as if you had but a day. And you are to prepare for ministry as if you had a century. And so I'm calling you, saith God, to both watch and pray and to prepare for the way to be manifested through you of my presence, my love, and my deliverance, both to the body of Christ and to those in need who know not me, but shall come to know me through your obedience and your awareness of accepting your responsibility and meeting it in every way, saith God. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. The Lord is very, very definitely dealing with, uh, with us about what he just showed, that we have to watch and pray as if we have but just a moment left. And what he's doing, he's doing quickly. He's doing a short work, cutting quick work, cutting it short in righteousness. But still, he showed me how we have to prepare like we've got all the time in the world. And he showed me that, uh, because he was dealing with me about a matter, that uh, even if I knew he was coming tomorrow, I'd have to prepare like he was coming a year, a hundred years from now. In other words, he's going to come right in the midst of our diligent preparation to serve him. If you're writing a book, you'll be on, you might be on the third chapter when he comes. He's going to tell you he's coming. You have to write that third chapter, just like you, and if it's an eight chapter book, you see. Praise the Lord. I mean, God is beginning to move in a new way, and he is going to prepare his body to manifest that presence of Christ through revelation, communication, and demonstration. We see, for example, in John 16, now I've got you in Second Kings, I know where you are, but John 16, that Jesus promised that when he would send the Holy Spirit back to the church that he was going to continue revelation. Uh, he said, the Spirit will speak and he will show. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, 1, as we have seen in our teaching on Revelation. But they don't tell us anything about God's saving work and uh, grace. And they do not reveal. The heavens declare the glory of God, but they do not reveal His will or how His children can have their needs met. So you need special revelation, supernatural revelation for this. And uh, you see... This is why, for those non-charismatics here this morning, this is why God has set the gifts in the church, is because two of the most significant are word of knowledge and word of wisdom, by which he reveals things to his people. Now, Jesus used this. The apostles used this gift. It's a supernatural means of revelation. Uh, for many, many purposes... For example, in uh, John chapter 1, Andrew findeth Philip his brother and said, We found him who is called the Christ, the Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You see, he knew his scripture. Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. And so Andrew said, Well, come and see. Praise God, he had an open heart. So if you're here to see this morning, just keep your heart open. And as soon as he walked in the presence of Jesus, here came the word of knowledge. He said, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. You see. And he said, Boy, that really impresses me. I believe you are the Messiah. So the word of knowledge there was a divine confirmation of a person's ministry and his word. And that's what it's given for. And what God showed me this morning, you see, you say, well, that's kind of general. Well, it's general sometimes because the Lord doesn't want to embarrass you. It isn't general always to the person who gets it. You don't want me walking down there and picking out three people, one who has sexual sins they need to confess, and it's a woman, and 
another woman who needs deliverance because she's resisting this word. She even comes here and she's resisting this. And uh, especially does she deliver, resist the occult method because she needs deliverance in that area, you see. And the Lord showed me, and you don't want me walking down there and saying, now you don't have the baptism, and you're here out of curiosity. But you see, the reason he gave me that, and that sounds a little general, but you see, if I went down and picked those three out, it would embarrass them, and some of them would deny it, and so it's their word against mine, and so God doesn't operate this way. But sometimes that word of knowledge comes, I just point right to them, I say, the Lord shows me you need deliverance, you so, and it just comes out. Well, the anointing to say that comes with the word of knowledge. A woman was sitting in, well, I've been preaching about ten minutes, and I just... Uh, right in the middle of a sentence I said the Lord's going to deliver you of all your doubt and fears <laughs> now you see <laughs> that can embarrass people if it isn't true <laughs> and uh, she began to weep softly and I knew but when that word of knowledge comes friends the anointing the knowing comes with it you know that you know and even if they deny it it doesn't matter you know you're right it's a supernatural knowing it isn't Intellect. <laughs> Because that is the sign of Pentecost, and it had to wait for Pentecost. But here's the word of knowledge in Second Kings 6, given to Elijah, <coughs> Elisha. Verse 8, And then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Here's the king of Syria warring against Israel, so they, here they're planning their strategy. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, this is Elisha, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. See, Elisha tells them, warns them of their plans. And so the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. That is, you know, a whole lot of times that this happened, this word of knowledge came. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of you is for the king of Israel? He felt, you know, someone was uh, a spy, uh, espionage agent, and revealing a secret. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedroom. <laughs> well, praise God for the word of knowledge. And so it's given, you see, I said God <clears throat> has set supernatural gifts of revelation in the church for many, many purposes, and here it is to deliver God's people. This often happens. It's given to help, to help us, to aid us, to deliver uh, the people of God, in many, many ways, we see this happen. I was speaking up in Illinois several years ago, and a woman had written me that while, if I was ever in Illinois to stop by, she needed some counseling. And my wife and I stopped on the way after the meeting to her home, and in uh, dealing with her, in the midst of the conversation, we got to talking about various things. To show you how the word of knowledge works, yet today, to deliver and save God's people, she said that, we talked about several supernatural things. She said, well, now one time, let me show you how God revealed to me something that saved my life, my baby's life. She said, we were traveling here in Illinois, somewhere out of Chicago, and uh, a blizzard came, and the highway became obliter obliterated, and we could not see the road, and so we pulled over the side, and 
uh, wasn't long until uh, you couldn't uh, couldn't see anything. She said, we let the motor run, finally ran out of gas, and sitting there in desperation, everything was just as far as you could see, white. And, uh, of course, the prospect was to freeze to death, and she said, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me in an audible voice and told me to get out of the car, to wrap the baby up, to get out of the car, and shut the door. When I got out, he said, take ten steps to your left. She said, I took... He was talking to me audibly. Now, this is a word of knowledge yet. He's just getting ready for that. <laughs> He's just talking to him, to deliver her. Take ten steps to the left. Now, he says, you walk ahead now until I tell you to stop. And she walked maybe a mile through that snow blizzard. And he said, now turn to your right. Walk till I tell you to stop. Now turn left. Now, I said... Now go straight ahead. And he said, now you watch and you'll see a row of houses. He says, now here comes the word of knowledge. In the third house are Christians. You knock on that door. (laughs) (laughs) Hallelujah. Well, praise God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She had it and so she wasn't uh, thinking she was out of her mind and hearing voices like poor non-charismatics wouldn't know if they were starving to death wouldn't know what to do if God sent a raven to feed them like he did Elijah like he did Elijah <laughs> they'd starve to death uh, if, if an angel started talking to them or the Holy Spirit they'd think they were having a, saw an angel that were having a hallucination or uh, were becoming schizophrenic but he said in the third house her Christian she knocked on that door and sure enough and when they saw her plight they brought her in and she said that saved our lives So the word of knowledge, you see, saved the king of Israel and the the armies of Israel not once nor twice, many, many times. And God still works the same way today. And it isn't always just to save a life, but uh, there are many, many ways. One time, for example, when I was uh, speaking on a Friday night and then had a Saturday morning meeting, following that, and driving all the way from here about 200 miles to that meeting, I always have to gas up somewhere between that and the other meeting. And uh, always do. But I, I spoke at my Friday night meeting and got, uh, well, I was awake the next morning, got up out of bed. I'd no sooner uh, put on the clothes till the Lord said, you're out again. Now, I had a meeting I had to get to at 10 o'clock, you see. So I didn't have time to debate the thing or to... to uh, think about it. I went out and looked at my gauge and there it was on empty. I'd forgotten to, to buy gas. Now the point or the significance of that was if I'd have run out of gas somewhere uh, I would not have gotten to my meeting or not gotten on time. So God reveals these things to us. This, this sort of thing happens many, many times in the life of a person who is baptized in the Spirit and who is serving the Lord <clears throat> and I don't mean in uh, preaching ministry, but in your ministry there, as you function in the body, uh, God will many times reveal these things to you, that you have a tire with a hole in it, and that sort of thing. We've had brand new tires, buy a new car, and God would show me a big gash in it. I never in the world ever get out and look at tires, you know, and then get out and that one particular morning, when we're going, you know, 70 miles an hour down the highway, brand new tires. Big gash. Of course it was going to blow out. So God was showing me that, not only to get me where I was going, but to get me anywhere besides in the grave. And so uh, the revelation of the word of knowledge is a tremendous thing when you see that God, by it, does still speak supernaturally today to his church. I heard W.B. Grant tell one time when he was flying on a plane how that he saw in a vision. You see, God can give you the word of knowledge, not just by knowing a thing with your uh, inward uh, consciousness, but uh, he can show you in dream or vision. And W.B. Grant, as I say, I've heard him tell how that he had a vision of his baby uh, back in Dallas, Texas, putting something in his mouth. Now, God doesn't give you visions uh, like this without an interpretation. He, He didn't know what it meant, of course give you a vision without an interpretation just to be giving you vision. So he didn't know what it meant, but he said he knew what to do. And he said, I began to rebuke that thing, whatever it was, whatever it meant, and pray against it in the spirit. And he said, when he got home, his wife (coughs) said, I want to tell you something. The Lord showed me, said, (coughs) I was sitting here on the couch reading, and I happened to look up just as the baby put something in its mouth. She didn't know he'd had the vision. And said that, uh, I reached down to see what it was, one of those long carpet tacks. 
that he put in his mouth. Of course, it had been choked, gotten choked on. So he shows things like this, you see, uh, to spare and to uh, to not only help you but to help your family. Uh, God has shown me things in dream and vision that that are helpful uh, along this line. I was talking to a minister recently uh, about uh, various things in the spirit, and he said to me that as he lay down one night that the Lord showed him a member of his church. He's a minister up near where we live. And uh, he said he didn't know what the significance was uh, of this, except that she was crying. And uh, so he said, I dressed and, and got in the car and went out to see uh, this member. He said, as I knocked on the door, she had her coat on, had the child by the hand, was ready to go out. And when she saw me, he said she began to weep hysterically. And I went back in the house to find out what was wrong. She said, uh, told him the reason why she was so despondent but said we were just getting ready to go commit suicide and I was taking the child and we were going to uh, drive in front of a semi-trailer with the car uh, God spared the life of this woman through word of knowledge we can thank God that he still moves in a supernatural way today that uh, that we should expect revelation we should pray for the manifestation of revelation through the body of Christ because Revelation isn't something that is stereotyped and already printed up and a closed book uh, because the scriptures themselves tell us that this is not the biblical view at all of revelation. That over and over again in the New Testament, God promises to continue to speak through prophecy and vision. In fact, the promise in Joel 2.28 is that <clears throat> in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He said, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see vision. Old men dream dreams in the last days. And so if there's ever going to be a last days, then the supernatural aspect of revelation has to come forth. And it doesn't matter what you believe about uh, revelation, if you ever believe there's going to be a last day or last days, then Jesus said in those days, revelation, uh, supernatural revelation is going to be restored to the church. And it's very naive and unscriptural to insist that all God is ever going to say he said in his word, because he himself does not say that in his word. He said, I set the ministry of the prophet in the church. He says, I set the ministry of prophecy in the church. He said, I've set word of knowledge in the church and word of wisdom and many other kinds of revelation. And so we should be expectant of this. Now, God not only gives revelation to confirm a ministry and to deliver his people and to help them and to aid them, but as we see, for example, over in Acts chapter 5, that sometimes he reveals to the church or to his servants certain things about people in order to expose sin or deception or opposition or error. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, while you're turning there, one time uh, I heard a knock on the door, and uh, as soon as the knock was on the door, here came the alerting of the Spirit, there's something wrong with the people who will be there, spiritually wrong. Well, I opened the door, and there's, there are people delivering my tape recorder I left. So what could be wrong with them? I thought, well, Hobart, you missed it that time. And uh, after all, this is the way you learn sometimes, the hard way. And... Uh, I still have that, that uh, anointed awareness, something wrong here. But what's wrong with the person delivering the tape recorder to them? And uh, what it was, the man who fixes the recorder sent his wife and, and daughter to deliver. There wasn't anything wrong with that. So I started to close the door and turn, just as I did. She said, uh, could I give you some Watchtower literature? You ever heard of Watchtower? And uh, went on to learn they were Jehovah's Witnesses. Hello. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses out there. <clears throat> that isn't good. And so I gave them my witness, told them I didn't, didn't believe theirs. I said, uh, in the midst of the conversation, I said, well, at least you have the right name to your movement, Jehovah's Witnesses, because I said that word isn't in the Bible. Witnesses, but not Jehovah. Now, I recognize most of you don't know that because 
you still use it and sing it, but you never hear Hobart Freeman use it because the Catholic priest invented that word in the 16th century. It's a hybrid word. It isn't God's name. Jehovah is not God's name. It's made up of two Hebrew words. Adoniah, Lord, and Yahweh, which is his Old Testament name. You put the two together, you come up with Jehovah. You see, the Hebrews never pronounced the vowels. I mean, never wrote the vowels. <clears throat> God's name became so sacred to them, which was not really the right way, uh, that they wouldn't even pronounce Yahweh. And when they would come to, to the word Yahweh, they would pronounce, they would say Lord, equivalent in English to Lord. They would pronounce the word for Lord, Adonai. And so this priest invented the word and put together the, the consonants, since the Hebrews never wrote vowels. You're in, still today, you can read Hebrew if you know how to read it without any vowels. You just see the, like cat is C-P, no A. And so, he put together the, the vowels and the consonants of two names of God and came up with Jehovah. So I said, you've got the right name because I said that isn't God's name. Yeah. Now that <coughs> may do a little something to some of you uh, emotional piety, but we're, we're going to teach you the truth here, friends. You'll never find Jehovah in Old or New Testament. And so uh, wherever, wherever we point out error to you, I then uh, just quit singing the songs that are using the terminology. And it became popularized, the name, by the American Standard Version. Up to that time, why Christians didn't even use it because it wasn't a common term for God at all. Well, anyway, he was alerting me to that. Not that I had to be worried about listening to Jehovah's Witness doctrine, but he was teaching me how to respond to the Spirit and thus know what a word of knowledge is. He was saying there's something spiritually wrong with these people. And so that's the purpose of it sometimes in Acts 5. But a certain man named Ananias and with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife being privy to it, and brought a certain man and laid it, a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, <clears throat> Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Why has it remained? Was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, upon hearing these words, fell down and gave up the spirit. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And sometimes judgment comes along with the word of knowledge upon people who are tempting the Holy Spirit, lying to the Holy Spirit. You could say lying to God, but it's the same thing. And sometimes judgment <coughs> falls on these people, and it's for the purpose of ministering fear to others, so that they don't. Uh, treat these things lightly. Uh, God does deal with people in mercy. But I want to tell you, it's all the other side of his mercy is his wrath. And, and uh, I can tell you of cases where people have opposed the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues and have actually lost their voice while they were trying to oppose it. These are actual cases. And others open their mouths to oppose it and start speaking in tongues. <laughs> So I thank God, God's God, and he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and uh, if, I, if I tried to figure it out, uh, I never could in a thousand years. If I was going to do it, I'd be consistent. I would say, well, now everybody's opposing it. I'm either going to judge them or show mercy. But God works it both ways in his wisdom. But sometimes it is judgment. Sometimes by word of knowledge, you see, a person can get delivered. And that's why God gives it. But we have to keep in mind that sometimes it's for this reason. And uh, <clears throat> it's to expose sin and error. William Branham tells of uh, ministering one time for about, oh, six hours, you know, uh, to just hundreds of people. And God had given him such a gift of the word of knowledge that in literally tens upon tens of thousands of cases, he never once missed whatever he said. That's the way it was. Gordon Lindsay, who recently died, was his crusade director for many years, and I've heard Lindsay tell, uh, when I was in Texas several years ago, uh, I've heard him say with his own lips that he has sat on the platform and the prayer cards, because so many people would come to Branham's meetings, you know, like uh, 50,000, 
that sort of thing, that you couldn't pray for all the needs. And so they'd have to pass out prayer cards. And the Lord would just select the ones that, uh, that he wanted ministered to that night. And so you'd have to bring a prayer card. And on that, you'd have to tell the nature of your disease or the need. Well, Lindsay said he would sit on the platform. He's done this for years, and he never once, never missed with the word of knowledge. Now, <clears throat> this particular night, he'd been ministering for several hours when, unknowing to him, two men, two ministers, non-charismatics who were opposed to the end-time move of the Holy Spirit, had plotted to reveal him as a fraud. That was their attempt, but this was just mental uh, mind reading. It was just mind reading, and uh, that uh, uh, if the thing wasn't true, you see, he could. They knew that he was reading minds, but they said he was doing that by the power of the devil. And if the thing wasn't true, then he would look at the prayer card and act like it's true, you know. And so they were going to expose him and put things on the prayer card, and one was going to go to the platform and act like he had certain diseases. And uh, when Branham went to pray for them, he would deny that he had them, or if Branham couldn't tell him what was wrong, since he didn't look at prayer cards, by the way, then he would expose him as a fraud. He figured he had it, you know, anyway. And so Branham never looked at a prayer card. Uh, Lindsay, he said, I read them, and everything he said, it was just right down the list, whether it was cancer or whether it was whatever it was. And... Uh, he said this particular minister, the, the, the two that had plotted, one stayed out in the auditorium. And he was just about the last that night, and Brian had been ministering, oh, six hours or more. And he said, uh, and of course, uh, the gift that God had given, the word of knowledge worked when he, when he laid hands on people. Now, that just happened to be the way that it worked with him. And when he took hold of the man's hand, he said, there's nothing wrong with you. He hadn't looked at the prayer card. Oh, he said, yes, there is. said, yes, there is. said, look at my prayer card. He said, I don't have to look at it. He said, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, he said, look on there. I've got cancer and tuberculosis. It's on the prayer card. He said, there's nothing wrong. You're healthy. In fact, you're, you're perfectly healthy. He said, what could have happened, you know, and I've said things like this because it happens sometimes. People get healed while they're waiting to come up here to get prayed for in our meetings. This happens. And they don't always go back and sit down. And uh, he said, what could have happened is through all of this ministry tonight, your faith was quickened and you were healed, sitting in your seat. He says, now you are well. That's all I know. And then this man turned to the audience and, and said, well, you see, he's just a fraud. He said, he's tired now. He's been ministering six or eight hours and the, the, the mind reading isn't working. And of course, uh, in seances, the medium often does get tired after a while. I mean, it's a very common thing in the occult. And they can only minister for so long because it's a psychic drain on them. Well, when it's from God, you see, there's no psychic drain. It's the Holy Spirit revealing it. So he said he's tired, you see, and he can't show this. And Branham said, and about that time, he got another word of knowledge. He said, I see you right now in a vision. I see you and another minister plotting to try to deceive me. And he started describing the room and the lamp on the table and the color of the curtains and everything else. <laughs> and he said, you plotted to deceive. And just like your Ananias and Sapphira, he said, now you didn't have tuberculosis and cancer when you came up here because now you do. He said, that's all. What you said you have is on you right now. And I mean, he had it and he died with both of them. Now that's on tape. I've heard that. Branham tell it. It happened up in, I believe, Toronto, Canada, uh, where, <clears throat> where actually all that's recorded and took place. Well, that man down there jumped up and repented of his sins. He didn't want it. <coughs> and the one here, he was, <coughs> he fell to his knees and grabbed Branham around the legs. He said, pray for him and it doesn't happen. You know, like old, uh, uh, who is it over in Acts, Acts 8, uh, the sorcerer, Simon. Uh, he said, pray for me. Branham said, it's out of my hand. He said, it's between you and God now. It's a serious thing to lie to the Holy Spirit. I can tell you stories of people I know firsthand uh, from our experience who've gone into meetings to make up tongues, you know, to try to deceive the church and then to expose them. They'll jabber something or they will memorize a phrase in Greek or Hebrew and then wait for the interpretation. 
And when, when, and this case has happened where something has come forth and then they stand up and say, this is a fraud because I memorized the phrase in Greek and I uh, spoke it backwards, you know, spoke the words backwards, that was in tongues. There he gave the interpretation, thus saith the Lord and all that business. I'll tell you, friends, uh, you're not fooling with man. You're not fooling with some Pentecostal church or glory bar. You're fooling with the living God. I have one of those cases in my files where I've dealt with the people that were in that church and the minister of that church went out and tried to do this. And uh, then they made up a big uh, uh, document and sending it out to people how the tongues are fraud and all of that. And they said, uh, well, how do you answer this, Brother Freeman? Because he did, the pastor did interpret those false tongues because he got up and, and quoted the Sermon on the Mount backwards in Greek. You know, like it was tongues. And when I read the interpretation, it was a prophecy. Right to that minister. So blind he couldn't see. So he'd already law. He'd already gone over the line. He couldn't see. And God said through the prophecy, I know why you're here. He said, I'm giving you an opportunity to repent. You see, it went right to him. And just right in the prophecy. And, and so the man who's anointed to prophesy, he isn't thinking out there they're false tongues. Maybe God will show that to somebody. That sometimes happens too, where he shows them that person's a deceiver. But uh, he doesn't have to, and he isn't, uh, the, whole, the whole area of the charismatic, you have to take the faith anyway. And uh, so he, he was anointed to, to prophesy, and he prophesied right to those false uh, professors of Christianity. So it's a dangerous thing, you see, because sometimes God reveals these things to show us sin and deception and opposition and error. I was speaking at a full gospel business meeting one time when uh, the pastor who had invited me up there uh, asked me to stay over and speak in his church the next Sunday morning. As I was giving my testimony, he introduced me to his family and I saw them sitting at the table and all of his family looked all right but one. Now you see sometimes word of knowledge is a sudden awareness you know things but you see we're also in the flesh and the mind and intellect tries to get in the way. That is to say, <clears throat> word of knowledge suddenly appears in your consciousness. And you don't know whether you thought the thought or whether it's from God. Sometimes you don't know. And I looked at all of them. They all look fine except one. And here's what I got. He's unsaved. He doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't believe a word you're saying. Oh, I said, hold on. That's, that's the minister's son. You're not going to go by appearances. I've gone by appearances sometimes and missed it. Like... <clears throat> One woman, as soon as I walked in the door, oh, praise God, I heard you speak, glad you're here to teach, just waiting for this message. And then I really gave a deep message on faith. She sat there looking like she was in pain. I thought, ma'am, what did I say? Turn her off that way. Uh, did, I, did I move too fast for her charismatic experience? I thought, boy, she, she sure isn't going along with this message. She came after the message. She said, I've got to have that. Whatever it is you've got, I've got to have it. Well, you see, she wasn't in pain or opposing the message. She was distressed of spirit because she wanted to go deeper. So I learned not to go by appearances. So I said, I, I'm not going to judge that fellow. And then <clears throat> we stayed overnight as soon as I got out of bed. A lot of these things come to you before the mind gets to operating, you see. You ought to be ready for that. God show you things in your sleep because, you see, in the dream state, uh, you are... You are um, you are more open to the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Some of you, God, will have to speak but dream. You'll never catch it. You'll never catch it in the waking state. It's, that's right. Unless you learn how to be sensitive to the voice of the Spirit. And too long ago, I have. And if I don't speak it out, I miss God. So as soon as I got started to get out of bed, I saw him kind of in a mental vision. This wasn't the kind, if you saw the vision, you'd know, well, that's God, but... Uh, kind of a mental vision and I heard myself saying just as clearly as I'm talking to you but it was in the spirit you're not a Christian you do not have that baptism of the Holy Spirit even though you are the pastor's son I thought well now why would I be saying that to him and uh, I thought I'd forgotten it the night before so I still didn't let it register too heavily on me but I didn't reject it either and then I got up and preached on positive confession that you get what you confess you'll be what you think you are and uh, showed that wasn't mental suggestion or psychology. That's the word of God. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Yeah. I was preaching along that line. <clears throat> there he was, just as dead as ever, sitting out there. And I get the same witness in my spirit. 
He may be the preacher's son, but he's as dead spiritually as that post. Deader. <laughs> really. And so I finished my sermon and uh, the service, walked out the door, and he was practically standing in the door to meet me. I don't believe a word of that. Just like I'd heard him say in the spirit. He said, that sounds like Christian science to me. Saying, you know, if you, if you don't say you're sick, you won't be sick and all of that. I said, no, it's not Christian science. It's Christian sense. I went on to show him the difference. That Christian science denies the reality of disease and pain. Christi- Christianity admits the reality of it, but you don't get your attention on that. You keep your attention on the Word and confess it. Christianity admits the reality of it, but you don't get your attention on that. You keep your attention on the Word and confess it. So I showed him the difference, and then I said, I want to tell you something else. I said, you may be the pastor's son, but you're not a Christian. You're not saved. You don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, the reason I know it, it shows all over your face. And I said, God showed me that you would oppose this message and that you're an unsaved person in the church. Well, he kind of hung his head and said, that's right. I said, the reason God showed me that is because he wants to help you. you And so sometimes, you see, God shows you these things, not uh, pleasant things, but shows you people who are resisting the truth or who are uh, in a condition whereby they're going to perish if they don't wake up. And you're going to have to learn how to respond to the Holy Spirit because the word of knowledge isn't always going to come as a dream or a vision or audible voice. It's going to come by that inward knowing. He'll reveal to you some spiritual uh, condition of a person in order to save them or deliver them, to help them in some way. You see that over in John 4 when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He began to tell her things that only God could know. Uh, He said to her, Go call your husband. Verse 16, and tell him to come here with you. John 4, the woman at the well. And the woman answered in verse 17, said, I have no husband. Now here comes the word of knowledge. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And him whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that saidest thou truly. Well, praise God. She didn't say, What are you, a mind reader? <laughs> Fortune teller? She said, I perceive you're a prophet. Hallelujah. Praise God, a Samaritan. And you've got Christians filling our churches today. When you come along with the word of knowledge, they say, well, he's reading their minds. Are he's psychic. Or he's a fortune teller. Why, one country in Sweden, one country in Scandinavia, Sweden, I believe it was, or Denmark, uh, <clears throat> wouldn't let William Branham back after one meeting there. He said he's a mind reader and he violates the laws against fortune telling. So she said, you're a prophet. And you know the story, as a result of his word of knowledge about her, she got saved. Then over in Luke 9, sometimes Jesus uh, would use this word of knowledge to correct error. God shows you the unpleasant things as well as the pleasant to help people. Luke 9, verses 46 to 48. There arose a reasoning among the disciples, which of them should be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me, for he that is least among you all the same shall be great. So it's the least that's going to be the great. And, uh, which is another subject. But the... The revelation here of a division or a contention among the disciples was to correct spiritual error. Sometimes to save or to deliver, to stop a person who's on the wrong track, or to convince them that what is wrong with them, uh, God wants to deliver them of it. I had a young man once uh, that came to me for help and said that he had a particular problem in his life and said I just can't get free of it he says I prayed I fasted I'm a spirit filled Christian but I've got this problem I can't get rid of it well I said brother when you've got something you can't get rid of it's an obsession then it's occult you've dabbled somewhere with the occult Ouija board or something and you've got a door open to oppression 
It doesn't matter how hard you pray, until you close that door, Satan has access rights to your life to oppress you. Now, it may be in that form. Of course, the oppression, as we've taught you, can be in many, many ways. Or I said, no, I've never done anything. We went through the whole list, and he hadn't done anything. I couldn't find a thing, but I said, there's something that I haven't mentioned. I can't remember what it is. I said, I've mentioned everything that I can think of. It's occult. You haven't done any, but there's one thing I can't think of. At least I want to ask you that. And I couldn't remember. And then suddenly it came to me, water with you. Now, he's just a young fella, and no reason, you know, like 19 or 20, no reason to think that he'd been water divining, witching for water. And I said, that's the only thing I haven't mentioned. Oh, he said, I said, have you ever done that? Oh, he said, uh, yeah, I've done that. Well, that was the only thing he had done, you see. It was alcohol. He said, my father's a plumber, and he said, that's the way we locate the sewer pipe, by divining for him. That's a lot easier than digging up all, the whole yard. He said, you can locate them if you have the, the gift. Well, I said, that gift's not from God, it's from the devil. Oh, he said, that couldn't be the cause of my problem. What's the relationship between hunting sewer pipes with a willow twig and uh, the fact that I've got this terrible problem? Well, I say that the connection is just this. If I tell you a problem, then God is telling me that you need to confess the water with you to get rid of your problem. Well, he said, if you can tell me the problem, I said, well, I've known it since you've been in the study. And I told him what it was. I mean, it was a sex sin. I told him what it was. I, told, I mean, I identified it. I just didn't say general sex. You know. Well, he never fell on the floor. He said, well, it has to be then that, that the water witching is a sin and this has opened the door to this thing I can't get rid of. And so we prayed for it and it, he got delivered of it. So the word of knowledge comes to, to reveal a spiritual condition and help people uh, to convince them that what is wrong in their lives is revealed to you so that they can get saved. Uh, one brother tells of having a neighbor who was a Jehovah's Witness. And one time he said they were talking over the back fence together and the Jehovah's Witness was really laying down the uh, doctrines of Jehovah's Witness and trying to convince him. He said, I didn't even argue with him because while he was talking, the Lord was showing me all about him, his spiritual condition. Well, he said, um, he said the only problem with Jehovah's Witness is that, uh, that they're not Christians and you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Well, I said, no. He said, I, I, you were with a red-headed woman last night in a motel and it wasn't your wife. Well, he said he began to deny it. He said, no, no point in denying it. He said, I described the car, the color of it to make, the motel, the name of it, the bedroom, and the room number and everything else. And I said, there was a knock on the door, and it was her husband with a gun, and you fled out the window, and that's the only reason you're here talking to me, is because your life was spared, because you escaped. Well, that kind of convinced him <laughs> that God was in it. And he said, as a result of that, he gave up Jehovah's Witness God and became a Christian. So the revelation of a spiritual condition, one spiritual condition, is not just to criticize or judge a person, but sometimes it's the only way that God will deliver them out of the hands of the devil, out of that sin or whatever it may be. But God is speaking to our spirits. He speaks in dream and vision. He speaks audibly sometimes. He speaks through prophecy or tongues and interpretation. And he's not just speaking general things, but he's speaking to us and our needs. He wants to help us. Sister was in my meetings once that uh, said it's rather humorous but how God uses this word of knowledge to help us. But he wants to help us. You know, he's like a father and his little child. He's concerned that you don't miss a thing that's good for you. And she said three different times. He, it, he gave me this, uh, uh, just like a, a bolt of lightning would hit my spirit. You're not getting my message. She was attending uh, our meetings regularly every week. <clears throat> You're not getting my message. You're not getting my message. And she'd say each time, well, Lord, I'm sitting there catching every word. In fact, I'm taping it on a tape recorder. And I'm trying to live it and obey it. What do you mean I'm not getting your message? She said, when the third time that God said, You're not getting my message. Now, there are a lot of people not getting the message from him, believe me. And he could tell a lot of you that, maybe, that you're not getting it the way you should anyway. I hope you're getting it this morning. But she couldn't figure out what he meant, and so she said, I turned my recorder on to listen to last week's message, blank. Then I went back for three weeks, blank, blank, blank. She said, 
I finally got what he was saying. You're not getting my message. The recorder isn't working. <laughs> Praise God. Which also points out the fact, friends, that he isn't allowing you to take messages just to put in on put on a shelf somewhere and say, "Well, I've got a list of Brother Freeman and Barry Clinton, and, but those are to be taped for you to listen to, as well as others." I could tell you stories about people who've been healed of incurable diseases because they've worn one of our tapes out. Whatever tape, you know, some of them just the basic elements of faith. What one woman? What is faith? Wear it out. Dying, literally dying, incurable cancer of the liver up in Virginia. She's been in our meetings testifying. She isn't dead. The doctors, all the people up there talking about a miracle. She wore that tape out. See, listening to a message once only introduces you to the fact that God loves you and he wants to do something for you, to thrill you. And uh, praise God. We get letters all the time where just like the literature. They say, every time I read it, out comes something new. And one fella, he said, uh, "Just uh, I just read the letter that um, he thought he'd gleaned everything from the Angels of Light book. He said as he went back through it again, he saw he'd been water witching. He'd forgotten that. And he said he had that cast out of him. He said it went out. It was a spirit still in me. Uh, so you'll get something new uh, each time you listen to it. I do. I certainly do. I mean, I mean, listening to me, I get something new out of it because... Uh, what God gives me, I don't always fully understand. <clears throat> All the things I speak. But he told her, you're not getting my message. Well, she was listening to it. So if you're going to bother to tape it, then there must be a reason for it. God wants you to share it. He wants you to listen to it more than once. And if you'll permit me to say it, and I'm going to say it even if you won't, is that some of you would mature more quickly if you would listen to some of these messages more than just hearing them here. It'll work. Faith cometh by hearing the word. By hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. It will come. Faith will come. We get too many testimonies to the fact that faith will come. But God reveals these things to help us. And he's helped me sometimes out of some ticklish situations by word of knowledge. I was speaking in Dayton, Ohio in a tremendously big uh, cafeteria. And I was right by the kitchen where they had no way to cut off all the noises of the kitchen. And as soon as I walked in, the Lord said, the PA isn't going to work. Well, you'd have to have a PA there even if you could speak like uh, uh, Charles had in Spurgeon. He could speak to 5,000 and out in the open air and they could all hear. If you had a voice like that, you'd need a PA in that particular place where we were. High ceilings and uh, it was a night when one of my sisters was going to be there and I could just see the devil trying to kill that because they already thought we were a little off the deep end. And if you stood up there and you couldn't be heard and all the people, uh, confusion starts, you know, right away when people can't hear. They start losing interest and wandering around. And so uh, the Lord said, it's the receptacle over there. Oh, we brought, we brought the PA system in, plugged it in, it wouldn't work. The Lord said, <clears throat> it's the receptacle there where they plugged it in. Now that would be a one in ten million chance you could never guess that there'd be something wrong with the receptacle there's never anything wrong with the receptacle you know the thing in the wall he said it's bad and so i said that all oh, no said there's nothing wrong with it. said look there's a man got his tape recorder and just like him you see it was turning you see the plug in so there couldn't be anything wrong with it. and uh time went on and the, the leader of the full gospel the president of the chapter he had a big booming voice and you could just barely hear him you see it was that that bad and the Lord kept giving me it's the receptacle doesn't matter what they say about it being good don't care if there's a tape recorder plugged in it it is still bad so I finally <clears throat> convinced them just before D, D day D hour when I had to get up and speak I said would you please go ask the owner of the restaurant about that receptacle because the Lord keeps giving me that they went and asked him oh I said yeah that's bad I said that one's bad I said it doesn't work and one of them looked, he didn't have his tape recorder plugged in, he was on battery. <laughs> he don't, all we could see was the recorder moving and he wasn't plugged in. There was a cord in it, but it wasn't him. And so he got in a, the right receptacle and Freeman went on the air, praise God. <laughs> I mean, it was the last minute. And I appreciate this present, this blessed revelation that God gives. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just about a parking place or where to eat and not get poisoned, but... Uh, <laughs> that's right 
Lord has done this. We parked one of our new cars once in a, in a motel. God said, don't park there. Just like that. This comes as a knowing. Oh, I said, look, highway's way off there. There's a big ravine between us and the highway, and there's a big uh, wire, one of those chain link, chain link fences. And you, you want to learn some things the hard way. You better learn to obey God the easy way. It'd be a whole lot easier to move the car and feel a little silly than to have happen at 9 o'clock the next morning the phone rang in the motel now 9 o'clock I don't know to go to bed to 1 or 2 so don't worry about the 9 o'clock but um, you better come out here quickly there's a man who had a heart attack came through the chain link fence down through the gully and up and your car was the first hit he practically demolished three cars and ours was the first I should have listened to that word of knowledge so praise God we're on our way to a meeting you see the devil many times has tried to stop us by pulling the wheels off cars we've had cars wrecked there it was oh it looked terrible it looked terrible the other two cars had to be towed away by wreckers we could drive ours off wasn't a thing wrong with it, it looked terrible it wasn't a thing wrong with it not even a light broken it had taken all of the impact of that car a fellow had died and came off of the turnpike and down through the chain link fence down through the gully and up and hit us first and hit the other two the others had to be towed away with wreckers we drove off to our meeting we looked terrible but God kept us running but the point was if I would have listened to that the voice of the spirit coming through that that warning then I would not have to go through some of the problems I did in that particular case well, you may be wondering how this revelation comes to us. You may be wondering how the word of knowledge, this gift that's placed in the body, works. How does it come? Well, you have to keep in mind it isn't going to come in your, in your thinking processes. It isn't a thing that God deals with with respect to your mind, reason, or intellect. That'll get you in trouble. In fact, if you try to think about what God is showing you, you'll miss it. 99% of the time when I have been anointed to minister in the spirit say through prophecy tongues interpretation I dare not get my mind in it if I do I'll miss God he's shown me things that would embarrass you to say them if you weren't anointed to say them and you speak them forth in faith and it's actually just like he said and so the word of knowledge is not a, it's not something you think it's something that happens to you you don't know what you, you know when you know it. You don't know that an instant prior before you know it. Because it isn't in your consciousness. It has nothing to do with education or intellect. You don't think the thought. And we can help you in any way to move with the Holy Spirit. I'd say that's the best way I know to help you, to, to try to get you to understand that you don't think the thought when God's talking to you. It just appears suddenly in your consciousness. Now, I, I know there are other ways, like vision and dream, where you see the word of knowledge. You see it, uh, a certain thing. But basically, it doesn't come that way. It comes by an inward knowing. Sometimes God will have you speak a thing that no one will respond to, like today, the kidney infection. Okay, if he believes that the Lord showed him that, then he did right to speak it. Because time and again... I have done this in meetings and no one responds until after the meeting's over. You open that door so we get some air. After the meeting's over, they come up and say, well, that was me, but I was a little shy, a little timid. And you can't call, you can't call people back, you know, and say, hey, it really worked. I had a word of knowledge that I didn't miss it and this thing is really genuine. And you just have to suffer the embarrassment of it. And a lot of times, at least sometimes, I'm sure God allows these things in order to mature you in the faith. That uh, if God shows you a thing and wants you to speak it, that you are to speak it in spite of what your reason or intellect says. Now, I don't mean by that you should be careless. I feel like some people are careless. They talk when they ought to be listening, maybe. At times, I mean. And uh, only you can determine whether or not the Spirit of God's talking to you. No one else can, can uh, show you that. But it's not a thing that comes to the mind or the intellect. It's a thing that appears in your consciousness. A brother came... So you're ministering to the sick. He said, I have a physical need. I said, yes, you have dysentery. You picked it up in Haiti. You know, it just comes out. But you don't dare think it. Oh, well, it's now. <laughs> he got healed. <laughs> kind of quickened his faith. <laughs> now, if, what happens if you, if you hesitate three seconds, you'll miss God when this thing's operating. When it's the awareness 
within. Now, as I say, it may come by vision. And vision doesn't take as much faith, but still it takes faith to speak it forth. I was praying in a meeting up in, uh, well, I was speaking in a Presbyterian church on the charismatic, and as I was praying in the motel, God showed me an elder, elderly man. I saw him as plain as I could see any of you. Curly gray hair. And uh, saw him plain enough, I could pick him out. And went in the meeting, there he was, right on the front row. This happens time and again. And so as I was uh, <clears throat> ministering, I believe it was at the close of it, I said to him, God showed me you in a vision as I was praying over in the motel. And I saw you sitting by an open window. He was about late 60s, say. And you were looking out with great expectation, like you were waiting for something. I said, now it's you that he showed me, but I don't know what that means. The word of knowledge, you see, didn't give me that. It just showed me a fact. He had been doing that, you know, waiting, waiting. He got up and said, that's right. He said, I'm a retired missionary, and I've been praying and seeking God, and, and I don't want to retire. He says, I'm, I'm seeking God for what's next. He's waiting with expectation. <laughs> well, then... Spirit fell on me and I prophesied to him. That, uh, and then he came at, and then he came and got the baptism with the tongue. And, uh, but sometimes it comes with vision. Knowledge. Knowledge of what a person is doing or saying or seeking. A young man I prophesied to one time, I said, the very thing you're praying for. Now you better be praying about something. They better be praying about something if you say that. That isn't as general as you may think, friends. Sometimes God can show you what they're praying. I said, the very thing you're praying for, if you won't doubt, if you'll hold fast to faith, God will give it to you. Just a few days he came and testified. He said, well, that, he didn't know I was praying for this. He said, I've been praying for a car. And he said, uh, my dad gave me one. And there it was, parked out front. Just a year or two old Buick. You can't beat that for a gift. Young man. Been praying about a car. Now there came word of knowledge through prophecy where I told him that he had been praying about a matter. Sometimes it comes in dream. Over in Genesis 20, uh, God told a heathen king by word of knowledge. See, word of knowledge can operate uh, even without the baptism occasionally. He tells Abimelech here, um, verse, verse 3 of Genesis 20, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art a dead man. Now here comes the word of knowledge for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is another man's wife. Now what happened there, of course, Abraham, uh, in verse 1, said to Sarah, verse 2, Tell anyone who asks you that you're my sister, and that I'm your brother. Now he wasn't lying. I've heard preachers get up and preach that Abraham told a lie there, and that's why he had so many problems. He isn't telling a lie. Sarah was his sister. She's half sister. He just didn't tell all he knew. Jesus didn't always tell all he knew. And we've already taught you. There are just some people you don't dare tell all you know to. You're not if you want to continue to minister in that area. And so, <laughs> he wasn't lying because you see in those days a beautiful woman, Sarah was a beautiful woman even though she was old. At 90, you see... Uh, and much later, why Abraham had to be careful that someone, if, 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 if uh, some of these powerful kings learned that she was your wife, he'd just kill Abraham and take her. But if he said it was his sister, why, uh, Abraham's life would be spared. Well, God revealed to this heathen king that she was Abraham's wife. Sister, yes, but he had married his sister. That is, his half-sister. And in those days, why, of course, it was permitted. But the point is that through the word of knowledge, God... God spared Sarah. He goes on to say, uh, Benelech apologizes. He says, well, I haven't touched her. He said, he told me she was a sister. And God said unto him, yes, I know that you did not, uh, that you did what you did was in the integrity of your heart. He said, I withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet. And he will pray for you, and you shall live. Well, hallelujah. You didn't know Abraham was a prophet. Yeah. Abraham was a prophet. Abel was a prophet. You'd be surprised how many prophets there are in the Bible. Prophetic ministry is quite common. It's supposed to be very common in the New Testament church. Are you asking God to set you in that ministry or to at least give you the gift of prophecy? 
Over and over in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, Seek, desire, covet, earnestly to prophesy. That the body might be edified. Strengthened spiritually. So Abraham was a prophet. And here comes revelation through a dream, through audible voice. In 1 Samuel 9, we don't have to read it. Uh, we already have once before. Where Samuel, uh, we're told that God spoke in Samuel's ear and told him about Saul and told him where the asses were when Saul lost his asses. And sometimes this word not only comes in the consciousness or dream or vision, but by voice. And so we wouldn't be, shouldn't be surprised if God speaks uh, audibly sometimes to his body to spare them like this sister in the blizzard praise God that she had the baptism of the Holy Spirit because when that voice began to tell her what to do it could be leading her over a precipice you know or in a gully somewhere uh, following voices you better know the voice of the Spirit of course I know one sister told me that this voice said to her get out of your charismatic church and go, back, go over in some denominational church and nine years later she said why would God tell me to do that I'm just dead drying up spiritually so I said sister surely you don't have to have, have me tell you that wasn't God that was an audible voice on it so we have to know God's voice and sometimes it'll mean the matter between life and death to, to respond to an audible voice uh, as well as an inward Peter Marshall tells one time walking out on a path where he was speaking somewhere, territory unfamiliar to him, walking along in the moonlight. When, well, a voice came out of heaven. He didn't. He'd never heard the voice of the Lord before, and it said, "Stop." That's all he said. The voice said, "Well, he didn't exactly stop. You know, he kept kind of moving along." The voice said, "Stop. Don't take another step." Well, he said, "Why, Lord? Don't see a thing." And he looked, began to look around. Couldn't see a thing wrong. He said, "Then I looked." in front of me and in one more step I'd have been over the edge of a precipice a cliff to the set God had stopped me just at the right moment well some people die by falling over cliffs but thank God God sometimes speaks and gives us knowledge of what the situation is and that's what this wonderful gift is all about it's a revelation of knowledge called uh, translated in the New Testament word of knowledge but it's a revelation of facts sometimes it's about the past but as well as the present. And we're going to see next time, if the Lord leads getting into the wisdom part of God's revelation, that the word of wisdom that he gives us, a revelation of wisdom, has to do with his great plans and purposes. Uh, whereas word of knowledge always deals with facts. And so the fact sometimes is about you and your safety, or your ministry, or your wife or husband, or children. Uh, reveal things to you in dream and by vision or an inward knowing that a certain condition exists, or uh, a revelation that you ought to pray for someone. I heard uh, uh, W.V. Grant tell how that when he, when he was in Africa, he had eaten some of that food over there and become poisoned, said he thought he was about to die. He lay there in his room, deathly sick of whatever it was he picked up. He said suddenly he felt just the, uh, the anointing of God, the fire of God, go all through his body and purge him of that. Well, he couldn't even pray for himself. He was so sick. And immediately was healed. And all right, went off to sleep. Now, many, many weeks later, back in a meeting, somewhere where he was speaking, a man came and said, You know, while you were ministering in Africa, the Lord awakened me one night and showed me, didn't show me what was wrong or anything. I don't even know. I'm just going to check it out with you. But he, he impressed upon me I was to pray for you. They began to compare notes. It was the same day, the same night, that he had him interceding in the Spirit on behalf of the, his, his minister. And it's while he was interceding by that word of knowledge, something wrong over in Africa. This brother said, This person is not me. It's a the end and the end. The earth is about the <laughs> Good night, it's nothing to that whole item. It's never been more heard of, but now, in our course, in the Testament, it's not to say that 
71, Claypool, Indiana, 46510.